Did anyone see the last talk? I didn't bring it. Yeah, I apologize. I didn't realize that was a requirement to speak this week. So we're going to talk about vulnerability scanning and integration. We're taking a slightly different approach, more we'll call it the poor man's version. Um, there's no Jenkins, there's no Metasploit Pro licenses, all these things. The idea is, let's go open source, let's use the tools that are out there, and combined, they are probably as powerful as a lot of the professional versions that are out there of all these things. And we're not really going down the penetration test route either. How many of you out there love to break things and love to send reports out to clients and drop them off on their desks and laugh and walk away? <laughs> right? We're on the red team, we like to break stuff. But we're also going down the path in this talk of what if we actually helped our development teams avoid these things before they pushed them to production? Would it make our lives a little bit easier? Who's broken apps so bad it took them a week to write the report up? How nice would it be to only have 10 issues in the report instead of 35? A lot less screenshots. So those are the types of things we're thinking of. And what I do with most of my free time when I'm not working um, I do some teaching with the SANS Institute in the application security curriculum. My name is Eric Johnson. I am local here in Des Moines as of the last year and a half or so. I was out in Vegas for eight years before that, learning how to circumvent the uh, casino security operations. I'm just kidding. Don't do that. You'll get thrown in jail. Uh, my email address is out up here on the slide. We'll show it again at the end if you have interest. We have some slides later hoping to invoke some participation from the community. Go ahead. My name is Eric York. I work with Eric. I don't have to, but I choose to. I went to a court order, so I make it happen. But I actually teach more SANS with Eric and do a lot of the .NET stuff. My email is up here, and so is my Twitter handle. Feel free to reach out. If I don't know the answer, I'll make it up. So feel free to ask any question you want. Our agenda. We're going to talk about our problem. I've kind of mentioned this already. We're going to go through what our requirements are for this scanning framework. We'll talk about the solution. Aaron has a fun demo he put together, and then you can ask all the fun questions that you want. So this is a percentage up here, 21.6%. This has not been released yet, but working with SANS, I have this a little bit before my webcast when I officially announce it in a month. This is the percentage of development teams that are responsible for their own security testing based on the survey that we had five or 600 people answer over the past three months. So, How many developers in the room? Got one, two, All right, three. couple people right couple. So no, let's no. pick on you, right? Do you do your own security testing? Um, somewhat. Somewhat? That's better than no. <laughs> yes. Yeah, uh, yes, that's, so you are in the minority. Yes, two out of three. Nice. That's good. But you're at a security conference. True. <laughs> so it kind of leads me to believe that you know a little bit more about why these things are important than most of the people that are writing code in our developer community. I'm just guessing. So what are the excuses for not doing this? Number one, I hear it all the time. Security is not my job. It's not my job, man. That's the security team's job. Have we heard this before? How many of you delivered a report to a dev team and said, well, you're doing that. I don't have to worry about that. It's not my problem. That's what QA is for, right? Yeah. QA. I did a talk at a QA, QA group here in Des Moines last week and tried to teach them how to do some security testing. So it's not their job either, according to the group that I talked to. So whose job is it? Everybody. It's job. everyone's job. job Come on. It? I know it's the acronym. Excuse number two, I don't have time. I have deployments to me. I have features I need to add. And they make my company money. So I have to do that. I don't have time for security. That's excuse number two. What happens if you get breached? How much money is that going to cost your company? More than missing a deadline. We'll say that much. Depending on your data. And number three, and this is my favorite one, where the dev team actually says, Eric, I love this scanner. And they're just telling me that, so I'll stop asking them about it. They're not actually using it. So it's good, it's smart. As long as you buy a license, right? You're good. Yeah, that Fortify is installed on their machine, so that means that they're secure. That's good. So these are the excuses I run into. 
And then we have our friend at Microsoft. Does anyone remember when this announcement came out? It's pretty powerful coming from one of the biggest companies, the CEO of one of the biggest companies in the world. And this was back in, oh, I'm blanking on the year, when they really hit a low point in security and Windows is just so full of issues, we started talking about you know, what's the next step. And he sends this email out to the entire company and says, when we face a choice between adding features and security from now on, we have to choose security. Have you ever received a communication like that? I have. Pretty solid though, right? That's direction from the top level going down. Do you think the development teams at that point found time to do security testing? I would say so. That's probably pretty effective. So there's always this method, but the problem is not everybody does this. So that's our issue that we're trying to solve. And then we have our questions. Okay, so let's assume that I now believe I should be doing my security test. And you're just getting started. And lots of people in this room are in security conference. We know this information. But one problem I find in our industry is that we're not very eager to help other people learn about it. Oh, we know this super secret method to do something. And I know it. And nobody else does. And I'm not going to tell you how to do it. Because I'm on the security team. And I can come over to your desk and I go, oh, check this out. Get out of the way. Has anyone seen that SNL skit? Move. And they put the type on the keyboard. Move. Right? So we need to tell them what type of scans they should run. Show them how to do it. It makes our life easier. Every scan they run is one less than I have to run, right? And then most importantly, the third one is, what the hell do the results mean? Cross-site scripting, what is that? So we have to train everyone on the teams that security is everyone's job. So that's what we're trying to accomplish. We want to get these results down in front of the development teams so they can fix the problem before it actually gets to our desk. What a novel concept, right? Okay, those are the common questions we see. So when we sat down and said, let's try to think of something, something simple that we can do, that there'll be a framework, we'll call it for now. We have a slide later where you can all vote on the name for this thing. And what should we have it do? Okay, we need some security tools in it. And they should probably be free because, well, if we're small shops, then we don't have money to spend 20K on a Fortify license or 25K on a lot of these commercial scanners. So let's start with the basics. Let's use ZAP, SSLIs, to look at our SSL config. Nessus does cost a little bit of money, but it's reasonably inexpensive. In maps free, find bugs, Nikto, W3AF, Skipfish. We've got all sorts of these scanners that all have some API capabilities that we can run against our sites and try to gather some preliminary findings. So that's step one. And the other thing we wanted to do was we wanted to be able to let you write your own plugins. So let's say you went out and you dropped 25 grand on a scanner. You should be able to add it into our solution, right? Let's just let you run it every time you check in. So new plugins, scalability is important. And then the benefits. We're scanning as things are being pushed out to the test environment. Now, what I'm here is as soon as you check in, it's going to kick off a build, right? Everybody who's going to be scanning this integration, someone's going to run a build. That build's either going to break or not break. Well, let's kick off a few more tests. Let's go ahead and do a deploy out to the test website. Let's run all these scanners against it. And then let's turn around and bring back a list of all the issues Cost us anything? Not really. A couple CPUs inside the time, 13 cents worth of power. Right? You can cook a whole turkey dinner, or you can scan a website. You know. <laughs> I choose turkey. Maybe it's not worth it. Well, second, we need a consistent and repeatable process because if we fix everything the first time, what happens if we do it differently the next time around? So we need to know what the scan results come up as the first time. Do it diff so we can see them the next time around. Make this a tight, iterative process similar to our Agile and DevOps movements. We're trying to keep up with the speed of development because it's impossible doing things the way that we currently are. And our end goal, of course, is to release more secure code in production, right? If there aren't security issues before it goes to QA, the chances of getting security issues before it goes to production are way minimalized. And we're fixing them in the beginning where it's cheap. The developers are writing the code. To have them write secure code is much less expensive than to go back through an entire development cycle again. So what did we come up with? Well, 
about 12.30 this morning, I decided that we could finally land on a solution, and so here's where we're going to start. We have the name. We're not quite sure on this one yet. We'll let you all decide. We'll come up with a name later. It's less important. My personal favorite is the Secure Lifecycle Usage Tool. But just like our last tool, the Secure Header Insertion Tool, Eric wouldn't let me name that one either, so. <laughs> we use Module instead, so we went with Shim instead of the Module. <laughs> The goal, near real-time feedback to development teams. So what if they could do this? They could push a button, and what if it was integrated into their build cycle, and it was something they had to do as code was being moved out from test to UAT to prod, all those types of things. Or if it's a close plug -in. I can right click and say, hey, run this locally real quick. Give me a quick scan and see if there's anything that's nasty before I go. Yep. And the other thing, we want it to be repeatable and consistent, right? Everybody remember all the command line options for all the open source tools they use? So we want it to be automated. Let's just forget all that stuff and let's let the scanner run. So our server side, well, of course, we're in a REST world, so let's create a REST API. And what if we called the REST API and it actually returned some information back to us in the same format, regardless of whatever tool we call? We can call 10 different ones, and if they are all speaking the same predefined format, then we can start to parse these build some rules around them on the client side, and guess what? We can display that to whoever it is that called the service. So that's what we wanted to start with. The other thing is we want to execute all scans from the same server. Anybody in an environment where you need to know what IP is bringing this really nasty traffic down? Yeah, once or twice. Or we're going to do a scan on a remote server where they want to know where it's coming from so they can put some rules in place to the firewall, right? Same kind of thing. We want to make sure that everything lives in a safe place, or at least then our client side is the most exciting because this is really whatever we want to use. I wrote a Python client last night to pull it down, proof of concept. This could easily be written in whatever language you want. And we'll talk about some ideas we have for this here in a little bit. But the idea is let's execute our server side code, we retrieve and display the results. Pretty simple concept. Quick yeah, Eric. You're up. There you go. So what we have, quite simply, is somewhere here. You probably want to see it too, huh? Man. That's what you get for using Windows. Oh, knock it out. Let's start your hating. I wrote it in Java so you could use it on your Mac. <laughs> you know how I hate Java. <laughs> All right. So our first initial thought of this was let's automate burp. Right? Exactly. We use burp all the time. No, we started with burp. Okay, we this whole thing started with burp. And we said, you know, we can write a burp plugin that would have X. Yeah. Easy for me to say. Red lips. I'm so sorry. It's a good thing you don't speak for a living. I know, right? So, we're going to automate burp. We're going to write a plugin that would implement export. I'm going to stop saying all those words. Just insert your own word that works there. An API that would allow us to automate burp. Go in and set it and have it automatically spider a site. Have it automatically do some of the base attacks, right? Burp's a great tool, 300 bucks a year, can't beat it. Turns out Zap does all that for free. It's got a built-in REST API, right? So if I just go to my local port against Zap, whatever the proxy's running on, it automatically has a REST API. I can go to the local API, and I can do things like spidering a site. I can come down here, and I can say scan a URL, and I can say open csurf.cddexploit.net, scan it, and down here in Zap, it's actually, theoretically, be nice now. You need a .net at the end. It should be. Oh, is it .net? I don't know. That's what he said. I don't know. Anyway, if I knew how to run the tool, you could actually run it from the API. But see, I, it's not repeatable and consistent because I can't even type the stupid thing. So what we decided, let's just put a server in front of that. Let's say that we're going to have a set of processes, right? And all we're going to do 
a REST API that we can do things like spider site. And when I say to spider the site, I want you to fire up Zap, go to a website, look up the information, run the active scanning against it, find any of the alerts, and bring them back to me. Right? Six steps that I can automate because of that Zap API. So, as you can see, we're going to list all those out. So we just call process slash list. If we want to find out what they do, we can get the detail. Again, it just comes back in JSON. So I can run it any way I want, format it, turn around and play with it. This one uses a Zap proxy to run a spider on it. And then, if we actually want to scan it, we can just, it is done it. We can just tell it to process, and that calls a scan. It's a really simple interface on the inside. I'll let this run for a second, because it takes a minute to spider the site. But you can see that it's already gone into Zap. It's found that site. It started spidering it, and it's working on the active scanning. So in the code itself, it's really simple. All you need is a dot .scan method on your object. So in here, on the OWASP code, all we do is stand up one of their client APIs, tell it to go get the data, get the alerts, whatever, tell it to do an active scan, and then bring back the data for us. And what we end up with is this neat little list of alerts coming out of the active scans, which is going to match our list over here. Here's all the 36 things that it found. Which is all great if you like to read JSON. Anybody here got JSON eyes? After about two minutes, all the squigglies become squares, become Martian reading, and I can't understand anything. It's kind of the way I am. So Eric was nice enough to run a, write a little parser for us. And it's just a real quick stand up the server, hit our REST server, call the SSLI's client against the domain, call the Zap Spider against the domain, and then put it all in a neat little HTML format. So if I run that Python script, it's going to come by. It's going to run those, pull those same JSON objects, bring them back, and throw them out to an HTML file. So now you can see SSLIs is done. One of the things we did with the SSLIs client, anybody here run SSLIs all the time? You do the same thing over and over and over. You look at an SSLIs report. You look, oh, look, 112 bits. Cite that. Look, I found out that they're using DES. Cite that. I found out they're using RC4. Cite that. They're using SSL v1, v2, v3. Doesn't matter. Cite that, right? It's the same thing over and over and over. Well, why not automate that? So if you look over here in the SSLIs code, some basic rules. If you find the index of 112, we know that there's a bit problem, so we're going to create an alert for that. And what we end up with on the back end, then, on the client system, we can pull up the results of this tool, and you're going to see SSLIs found problems, right? Found an RCA SHA, RC4 SHA, found DES issues, more RC4 and DES issues, right? And then we have all the alerts that came out of SpiderSight. Could we filter those down, decide which ones are right, those kinds of things? Yeah, sure. So now we've got all this information that we can pull and automate and take action on. If we wanted to turn around, use that client, and instead push it out to TFS, create bugs for everything that we found. Is that difficult? No. A couple lines of code, right? We want to do the same thing with uh, JIRA or any of the other ticketing systems. There's already libraries out there for us to do all that stuff. So let's use these automated sources. Let's push them through. And we can add any tool we want. All I have to do is add in another command line operator or another Python call or whatever we want to do to get that data back. And then just parse the results into a format that we can understand over here. 
So, any questions about that? Good, because I'm not going to answer it. Up <laughs> oh, too late. Sorry, I missed your opportunity. Oops. Just kidding. What you got? Configuration will be big for those types of sites. You'll have to make sure your spider is accurate, give the tool what it needs to get in there and actually give you some accurate results and flow paths through your application. Yes.
you have a spider that's not working, we know it's not quite reliable. We can go ahead and put all those endpoints into the app and make sure the scan actually hits all of those requests. So if you pre-capture, pre-configure, then we know the scanner is testing what it needs to test and we only have to iteratively update it as we build out new endpoints in our app, things of, things of that nature. If I introduce a plugin, uh, the code plugin, Visual Studio plugin, so that you can have it, it's your code right there. If you're running it locally against this IIS that you can hit with that scanning server, let it hit it. Kick it off, find out what's going on and what you just written while you're doing your regular testing and playing around. Uh, a Maven plugin so that you can turn around and do that. Ant plugin so that you can do continuous build. TFS plugin, same thing if you're using Microsoft's build server. Cruise control, all that kind of stuff. Result interpretation. You know, it's great that it runs that system live. It'd be even better if what it came back with actually made some sense to it. It didn't support some things. Going back to your false positive. And there's two opportunities for false positive removal here. We can go to the server side, and in that parsing code, we can say, okay, we know these are bad, remove them. If for your environment, even on the client side, that's another opportunity to uh, strip those out before you actually display that report out to your users as well. And then so integration with TFS quick fix, the kind of stuff that we were talking about, to be able to push those bugs back so that the developers can grab them. So all kinds of open source stuff that Oh, Sands maybe put this in here. There's their application security curriculum slide. If you are, or your organization needs training for your software development teams, they have an entire curriculum dedicated to that. And That's it. that looks better. And we didn't bring you We didn't bring beer either. But we do have whiskey. So just say it. Forget the candy. <laughs> so plenty of time for questions, comments. Does anyone have a good name? That's the most important. Think about it, get back to us, you have our contact information, take the card, and we'll be glad to take off suggestions. Any questions? all these scanners down they all have some of those so these are again configuration things say we get to the point where we can release this as a Linux distribution for example and you can install it down in your maybe in a network where all of your apps are deployed and we get on there let's configure zap to throttle back or work to throttle back if we need to I know we've all tripped WAFs and all those things before on accident and got ourselves in trouble got ourselves logged out on accident so <laughs> on accident that's that's why I protect myself um, so yeah, those are all things to keep in mind. And if we do have those things in place, we probably want to disable them in our test environments for this particular purpose because we're not really testing the application very well either if we do that, right? We're testing a WAF, not our code at that point. So great observation. Hey, there's all sorts of hurdles and we'll have to address those when we get there. And that's why we're hoping everyone will jump on board and, and help us out with this project, because it could be pretty cool. I did like the Jenkins idea from the previous talk, because that'd be a way to schedule these out and launch them from a more uh, foundational scheduling tool, so that could be something to look at also. So What's that? Yeah, we're looking more for alpha testing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Is there anything before alpha? Or? Yeah, pre-alpha, pre alpha, pre -alpha. <laughs>
I'll go to next, more to, to go down the developer path, is I want to plug in for Visual Studio or Eclipse or whatever IDE development teams are using, and I want a big green or red button in there that says scan my app after I deploy it, and I want those results immediately fed right back to the developer that just checked in and released code. That plugin should have a list of all the things that have been on the static analysis. You write code, your code, you check in. The build server deploys it to the test server. Yes. The test server gets hammered by all these tests. And then back to Eclipse, in one of the little boxes down at the bottom now, you've got a list of all the things that are found. And I can double click the thing you write to the code, or it'll take you to the page, or it'll take me to where we found it. Yeah, that's really fun. Yeah, because I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of finding SQL injection issues and in applications when we could have just showed it to them up front and gotten rid of it. Six months before we pushed it. Are you coming tomorrow? Are you coming to the training tomorrow? We'll spend the whole day giving you very good demonstrations that you can use to get some funding for security training for your development teams. To be continued. Some stuff on there, and maybe we should just create a mailing list. So, we'll, if we create